And we are live once again. Hello and welcome to another Storm Water School session. And you may be thinking it looks a bit different, but this is because we've got Lisa in the hot seat today. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Good. You're tr you travelled down yesterday. How was it? It was not the best journey, a bit of traffic yesterday, but I got here in the end, which is yeah. the main thing. Yes, and yeah. you're here and uh, not in Glasgow, so that's why it's on the one screen, not the split screen, as it usually is. But it's great to have you here. And it's great to be here. Thank Good. you. So how's your week been? How's your weekend been? Um, the weekend was very nice, thank you. Yes, yeah. it goes too quick as they always do, but only a few days away from another one, but we'll make the most of it. So exactly, yeah, exactly that. So today's session, Stormwater School, as always, is all about our attenuation and soak away tanks. And the first being our main topic that we've got Lisa in the hot seat to really discuss in much detail is how does an attenuation tank work? So this is a um, frequently asked question that we get mm -hmm. from time to time. So Lisa, take it away. How does an attenuation tank work? Um, I mean, it really is a very, very simple um, system, you know, a very, very simple tank, essentially. It's used as a holding tank. So um, water will enter the tank. Um, usually by this point, it's gone through some filters, some silt traps to, you know, try and clean it up as fast as possible. Maybe went through some other suds elements, such as a rainwater harvesting system or tree pits. Um, and so when it reaches the tank, this is, um, you know, it comes in sometimes through multiple pipes, inlet pipes. So sometimes the water is just coming in via one manhole. Sometimes there's manholes um, dotted all around, depending on, you know, the layout of the site. And sometimes um, the water from, like, you know, um, like channel drains and everything is also just going directly into the tank. So there can be multiple inlets, but usually there's only one outlet. Um, so the water enters the tank um, through these various inlets and channels and it basically is, is, is a void, it's a space for the water when it's flowing incredibly quickly, such as in a large storm event, to build up, um, you know, to, to build up and uh, fill so as not to overwhelm the drains downstream. Um, so the water will build up in the tank and usually at the outlet manhole, which I mentioned there's usually generally one outlet, um, there is something called a flow control device. There's, there's different ways to do this. Sometimes for smaller tanks, it's as simple as um, a small a smaller orifice plate, a mm. small hole, like, you know, water comes in through a large diameter pipe, so through a small diameter pipe, which will naturally slow the water out and allow the water to build up. But for some of the really, really big tanks to do, there's like proprietary systems called flow control devices, usually vortex flow controls, um, which um, essentially swirl the water um, and slow it down um, at a controlled rate. These are designed specifically to the tank because it depends on the tank height, mm -hmm. the allowable discharge rate of the pipes downstream, which again will be different every yeah. site, you know, depend on the size of those pipes. Um, and the tank size is um, taken at, the tank size is designed for all these factors, um, such as the allowable outflow rate the volume of water that they predict will come in. Um, they predict this by looking things like um, rainfall for that area, you know, traditional rainfall for that area. Um, obviously, the amount of um, surface water, which has been the surface area, rather, which has been paved over, which will create a runoff rate. Um, you know, larger, larger paved and built on areas will create larger areas of runoff. Um, and also, they have to build in an element for climate change. Usually, um, something like 30 to 40% is added on top um, of this um, to take into account the fact that, you know, we're all going to, um, the world's getting warmer and climate change is going to be a factor. So the tank is designed for all these things, so it should never really fill up. And like, if it's been designed properly, it should never completely, mm. it should always be able to cope with any site um, and the flow control has been designed properly. So that's how they work. It really is, it's, it's as simple as that. It's a, it's a, it's a holding area for excess yeah. water, which will be allowed to discharge um, down the pipe at a rate the pipe can control. It can cope with. Yeah. And you mentioned there just um, early on that with an attenuation tank, it can have multiple outlets and usually, or multiple inlets, sorry, and usually one outlet. Yeah. But it can be sometimes the case where the inlet and the outlet is the same pipe going in and out of the tank. True, that is, um, it's less common, but it is something called an offline attenuation tank. So um, tank the tanks, like I mentioned, we have, which have inlets and outlets are called online. So essentially that's because they're in a line, you know, mm -hmm. water comes in one side and goes out the other, they're in line. Something called an offline attenuation tank um, has one inlet and outlet, and it's designed as a, you know, um, when the water is flowing at a really, really um, say big rate through the pipes, they're usually kind of put somewhere mid-system, and they will just fill up. They will slow the water going down the pipe as well and fill up. And then um, once they're full, they will drain back out. And the, the storm event has passed. They will drain back out the same inlet that they come in. So, yeah, that's called an offline attenuation tank because 
um, the water isn't flowing through, it's coming in and out again. But yeah, they're not as common as the online attenuation tanks, but yes, they are something that we, we see on drones. And with one way to identify with, say, an online tank, what the difference of an inlet and outlet is usually the height of the pipe and the location to yes, the tank. Yes, um, I mean, sometimes for online and offline attenuation tank, uh, offline attenuation tanks, the inlet and outlet being the same hole, that will always be at the bottom of the tank. It will be the same, the pipe will be at the bottom. So you have to understand that if you don't have the pipe at the bottom of the tank, it will not be able to drain out yep. fully. Um, for online attenuation tanks, the inlets are sometimes midway at the tank, top of the tank, sometimes even coming in on you know on the kind of top surface yep. of the tank. But the outlet again must always be right at the the base of the tank, um, so that you know it empties out completely. Otherwise, it'll fill up once and never drain out again. So you've essentially lost some of the volume. Of yes, attenuation tank. In that case, it will then turn into. Um, a detention tank and the fact that it will exactly. retain some water for reuse not actually yeah but then no one can access that because unless it's been designed as such mm. then you know that water will just stay there yeah. indefinitely and if you yeah. don't have the outlet at the bottom of the tank once it does fill up your then attenuation tank will be half full most exactly. of the time and then so, so for the next large storm event you've lost that capacity mm. for you know the climate change for the large storm event for the rainfall and you're opening yourself up to flood risk yeah. again which defeats the purpose of the tank perfect yeah having you summed that up very well Thank you for that. No problem, thank you. And now uh, it's time for my favourite subject of all of it. It is in the news. Um, yeah. David usually rolls his eyes at me when I say this because I get too <laughs> excited. And he has to kind well, of this is really out. a fabulous one, so I'm actually quite excited to talk about it. <clears> this really is, is actually an yeah. incredible story, and it's a bit um, self-gloating, but we're allowed to do that because um, I can say so. Um, but this in the news is all about uh, what we call the soakaway tank in the desert sand. Um, yeah. And it's about a project that Graf have completed, that the Graf group have completed in Kuwait, out in the Middle East. And this is an absolutely incredible story. It and is. it's mind-boggling what they've done. Yeah. So in Kuwait, they've built a city, literally a city from scratch. Uh, they started in 2018 and they're finishing this year. Uh, it's called South Atmutla. Um, I hope I apologize I haven't that. <laughs> so you, you're free to google it it is a true story we haven't made this up so this town will house over 400,000 residents i think it's about the size of paris this city it's yeah amazing enormous city yeah because apparently like, we have a bit of trouble with them um, you know overcrowding and mm. like you know inner cities and everything this was the kind of this this project's been designed in record time to come you know like to solve their housing crisis essentially keep rents low so it's an amazing project because mm. it's a bit like the idea in i think it's saudi arabia where they're going to build that um city oh, so the, in the line in a line oh, my yes goodness, what's that called again yeah. i can't remember I can't what remember. it's called but it's very much in a line and it's not that wide and basically every um city within a certain amount of um kind of meters has a school a hospital mm -hmm everything a society needs yeah. um, basically within certain sections and then you obviously have to get passes to get into different sections however what's cool about this is like you said they need to overcrowd and, and why love is just a radical idea that should literally just come to life and it is they've just built a city from scratch in the middle of the desert um you know house 40 400 residents has over two twenty eight thousand buildings and like i said it started in 2018 um, and it's now finishing this year. And there's over, there'll be 156 mosques, and you see on the screen, 144 public parks, 116 schools, 48 shopping centres, and 12 public health centres, which is vast. Incredible. It's absolutely, absolutely incredible. Insane. I mean, I think any city in the UK would would crave numbers yes. like that of schools, you know, shopping precincts, etc. Yeah, to so have really those amazing. Kind of like public services. Exactly. They would, it'd be absolutely incredible. <clears throat> And obviously, how we link it to Graph is we um, have supplied and installed the soakaway tanks um, yes. there for this project. Um, and there's over 15 soakaway tanks throughout the whole city, ranging from 6,000 cube all the way up to 55,000 55, cube, cube, which region. is really is in a massive scale. And I mean, people might think you eat a very dry climate, and it mm. does traditionally have a very dry climate. Um, but there has been some recent problems again, mainly due to global warming yeah. um, of incredibly heavy rainfalls, unpredictable mm. um, heavy rainfalls, which the existing you know so sewer systems um, haven't been able to cope with in the existing cities. And so the kind of thought ahead was to design this to make sure that it can cope with these future rainfalls, especially because it is so far from the sea, mm. so far from any natural water courses, yeah. um, and the soil is not particularly permeable. 
um, that these um, soaky away tanks have to be huge mm. um, and they have to be able to, you know, essentially deal with the storm waters on their own because it is so far from other water courses and everything yeah. like that. So it, um, it's a huge project. It's... And, and Graf were commissioned directly to, mm. um, des- now to help with the design and um, supply the materials, essentially. Yeah, so over a million EcoBlock Max crates have been stored for this project, which is a- absolutely insane number. <laughs> And the tanks can hold up to a billion litres of water at any one time, which is insane insane amount. Yeah, absolutely insane. Um, you know, it's just a, it's just a great um, project which shows that, you know, if the, the graph are experts at things like design and taking on kind of these, these tough mm. projects that other people potentially Cause it's uh, like, wouldn't be happy to do. Yeah, because you make a great point. It's the design, but there's also the logistic element to it, getting yes. over a million crates. To the desert, essentially. Yes, exactly. Yeah. To the middle of a desert to be installed is absolutely insane. And like the operational standpoint, like the whole kind of start to end point is just one. Like it has it there. It is literally a mega project. It is. Um, and it's absolutely humongous. And it's just done. Um, it's an amazing project. and really is a just massive feat of what we can do. Definitely. So I could say anyone, if you do have a spare five minutes, do Google mm. and read this case study properly because, um, yeah, really, I'm really jealous I wasn't involved in it directly, to be honest. Really I mean, proud that Graf have been involved in a project like this, but I really, really wish it was one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely insane. And to think that this has been built just in the middle of the desert as one massive um, city is incredible. And I didn't realise, because you don't think a desert would have the issues of rainfall mm-hmm. and infiltrating it and ensuring that um it's yeah like infiltrated correctly so it doesn't cause flooding um but this is a weird side note but i was watching uh ses rogue heroes on bbc that that does that strike me as something you would watch yes it's a great oh, it's a great show but they obviously parach- um, parachuted into the middle of the sahara desert mm-hmm. and one of the issues they have is when it rains because the um soil is impermeable because it's like sand yep it fills up so quickly, but some soldiers would get caught in these massive rainstorms because oh. it would turn the sand like to pretty much a quagmire. Like mm-hmm. it would make it turn it into literally quicksand. So if anyone fell in the water, they'd forget them out straight away because they are yeah, risk because, of uh, death. Obviously, yeah. yeah. I mean, as in the future plan, the future planning element of this is just really um, something I think we can all learn mm-hmm. from. Like I said, these um, the Kuwait is not obviously known for its um, no. for its wet climate. But the fact that, um, you know, the planners of this city, the designers are thinking about the future, thinking about these issues yeah. that we're all going to, you know, be very easy just to design it to current conditions. But they're thinking about, um, you know, the future and mm. global warming, which is a global issue. It is, yeah. Um, and these tanks, like I said, they're, they're humongous. Mm. Um, we'd like to think this will cover cover the city of uh, South Almatala. I hope yes. I've said that correctly. Um, um, Al- um, for many many generations to come, I think it will still be standing. Yes, yes. I think uh, more and more people more will time. hear about it. But it's yeah. absolutely incredible project, and we are so proud to be a part of it. And a big um, yeah, well done to everyone involved because it does absolutely. sound like an incredible project. Yeah, definitely. But that is it for in the news. My favorite subject, and I think that is one of my favorite stories. Um, it's absolutely incredible. And now it's time to answer any questions that have come in during today's live stream. So we'll have these brought up on the screen by our fabulous assistants in the back. And the first question that's come in is how close can attenuation tank be to a building? Um, I mean, the again, there's not one hard and fast answer to this one. It will depend on how deep the attenuation tank is um, and how much ground cover, etc. Um, so, for example, shallow tanks with little cover can go closer to buildings than deep tanks, which will go deep under the ground. The way the, the, the main factor is that the foundations of the building can have no structural bearing on the tank whatsoever. So the, you, you kind of find out where your tank can go by drawing an imaginary 45 degree line out of both sides of the foundation as such. Um, and that, that no, at no point should this line cross over any part of the attenuation tank. So, for example, if the tank was shallow, um, you know, here, it would be fine but if you had a tank that was two and a half meters deep Got you it. could you'd have to yeah. be further away from the building so um that the um sometimes they can be actually be directly under buildings we have done them before in parking structures you know especially things like in cities like london where um, space is a premium they've been actually been underneath the footprint of the building and the parking structure but have been designed in such a way that none of the support columns or you know the you know the, the foundations foundation are, are taking any loads um you know so um, they can be incredibly close or sometimes need to go very far away, but it will depend on the, the tank shape 
um, and you know the found the foundation design the essentially of the building. Perfect. That answers that one. Incredible answer. Um, and the next question that we have coming in on the screen is: How deep can attenuation tank or circuit tank be? Um, again, it depends on the crate type very much. Um, we have a, a rain block crate, which is a kind of traditional one piece crate, piece crate, which can go as far as seven metres underground, but it will depend on soil type, essentially. Um, heavier clay soils have more of a, um, a lateral loading and more of a, a loading on the tank, and so couldn't go as deep. But, um, you know, in perfect conditions, a rain block crate can go as far as seven metres underground. Um, graph equal block max, um, a maximum of five metres um, for the, kind of the soils that we deal with here. But again, quite often, um, the, the actual loading, when we put in the, the figures on, you know, the cover levels and everything, um, it's more like you know, somewhere between one and a half and mm. now two and a half. It's very, very site specific. Um, but the absolute maximum, I would say, for an equal block range is about five metres underground, 4.755 metres underground. Uh, but often the surrounding conditions won't support that. So, it's, again, we have to do calculations for every site, which we will do. Um, but that is, yeah, that's kind of your, your top levels, essentially, or deep levels, rather, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I, that answers that one. And then the next question that we've had come in, are attenuation tanks a part of SUDS? They are. Um, they come under what we would call the water quantity part mm -hmm. of suds. I said suds was four elements: um, bio, no, amenity, biodiversity, water quality, and water quantity. And so, water quantity is where the suds, um, the suds element, when an attenuation tank would come in, which is because essentially dealing with that yeah. quantity of water. As I said, an attenuation tank does not constitute a suds system. Mm -hmm. It's part of a suds system. The suds system is an entire like kind of holistic design to you now protect them I mean the same biodiversity of the site and you now for future generations but an attenuation tank is a very important part of suds yes to cope with that water quantity cool that answers that one um and i believe have we had any more questions come in no we've got a weird a shake of the head to say that no cool Thank you for your time today, Lisa. Thank you. Kim. Your knowledge is valuable as always. Oh, thank you. And now your hosting skills are also valuable. Uh, it's changed ever since I got the cue cards. That's what it is. Uh, can I just say, Callum knows just as much about suds as me, but he pretends he doesn't. He lets me take the take the credit here. I mean, I don't like to. <laughs> I don't like to blow my own trumpet these days. But uh, I did actually do the stormwater CPD a few months ago. You um, did. Yeah. Which I. To be fair, uh, I'm not going to say it's easy, but we have a lot of content on the screen that I was able to pretty much yeah. read off. Um, so I was able to do that one. And yeah, like you, how you mentioned with SUDS, there's the four elements and the quantity. Mm -hmm. and I was, it is a fascinating subject and of the biodiversity, the immunity and quality is so much of it. And it's like it's holistic. But yeah, I mean, I don't like to blame my own trumpet, but you know. No, you should. But the um, one cpd that i haven't done yet which i would be frightened to do is wastewater mainly yeah. i get up to the point of where it's all about the um dosing packages the phosphate mm -hmm. the nitrate and the additional packages and the disinfection i would just be screaming to david like <laughs> most people doing office like david come answer this question <laughs> well, that no would one, be no one knows more about that stuff than david and this all no uh, it is his favorite subject yeah. um and we haven't you know, have someone come in to basically see if he's all right. That's his favorite subject. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you for your time today, thank Lisa. You, thank Thanks you, Callum. Thanks very much. Down. Lovely to be here. And thank you for everyone that uh, took the time out of day to watch this. We hope you enjoyed it and I hope you found it incredibly useful. Come back next week uh, for a rainwater research session where we have David back in the hot seat when he'll be talking about his second favorite subject of all things. Um, so, yeah, have a wonderful week. And Lisa, have a wonderful week too. You too, Callum. Safe travels back up when you do go back up, but yep. we enjoy you come down here anyway yeah and i love being here thank you very yeah. much cool and thank you once again for taking part and taking time out of day and we'll see you on the next one